So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm David Lamb. I'm the director of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. Very glad that you could join us for this uh, third installment in our ISR Insights speaker series. Uh, we're up to about 100 uh, people, which is great, and I'm sure it will keep increasing. Uh, let me just say a few introductory words before I turn it over to our speaker. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ISR, um, our faculty and staff conduct research that addresses topics such as wealth and inequality, race and racism, uh, topics you're going to hear about today, uh, as well as a wide range of other topics, including aging and health, teen drug use, economic behavior, and politics. We have over 300 affiliated faculty uh, drawn from almost every school and college across the University of Michigan campus a reflection of the true inter interdisciplinary nature of our work. The goal of this ISR Insight speaker series is to create a forum for disseminating research findings of our faculty at ISR. Uh, so far, we've had two other fantastic sessions, one on the educational achievement gap during COVID-19 and the other on the latest results uh, from the Detroit metro areas community study, which gave us great insights <clears throat> into the pandemic's impact on Detroit, one of the nation's hardest hit areas. Recordings of those events are posted on the ISR website, isr.umich.edu, and we'll post information on upcoming talks on the website and on our social media channels, so be sure to check there. We have a number of outstanding talks uh, coming up in the coming weeks. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Fabian Pfeffer. Fabian is Associate Professor of Sociology, Research Associate Professor at ISR, uh, and Director of the Center for Inequality Dynamic Dynamics, a newly launched research initiative housed within the Survey Research Center here at ISR. As the country grapples with its persistent problems of racial injustice, Fabian's talk today will focus on one aspect of longstanding racial inequality, gaps in family wealth. Featuring new findings on the depth and persistence of racial wealth gaps, Fabian's talk will also clarify why rising levels of wealth inequality present a major challenge to the economic prosperity and opportunity of many families in the country. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, note that there is live captioning that you can turn uh, on and off using the Zoom controls. Also, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. I invite you to send in any questions you have through the Q&A a feature of Zoom throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll do our best to have Fabian answer the questions uh, before our time ends. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're up to 120 uh, uh, participants, so it's great to have you all here. Uh, enjoy the presentation. I'll turn things over to Fabian. Thank you, David, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for calling in today uh, during this time. I thought a uh, fitting topic today uh, would be um, talking about wealth gaps in between blacks and whites in this country as one aspect of racial inequality. Of course, we find ourselves at a very difficult and painful moment um, where frankly, a lot of people are starting to educate themselves about other aspects of racial inequality, such as black white gaps in uh, police violence uh, and police killings in incarceration. And um, today's talk is in some ways meant to expand that perspective, uh, to provide additional information on another dimension uh, where black-white gaps are really, really tremendous, as you will see during today's presentation, and are continuing to be replicated. Um, that's, of course, just a very focused perspective on just one dimension of economic well-being, wealth, and on just two groups, black and white. So in the remainder of the talk, I will not really talk about other racial and ethnic groups or other dimensions of racial inequality. But it's certainly a dimension that is worth focusing on. So we'll begin by just looking at some of the numbers um, that tell us just how big racial wealth gaps in this country are and how they're reproduced. After that, we'll leave a focus on uh, race and talk about wealth inequality more broadly to make sure that uh, we can underline that wealth inequality is the problem for all of us. And finally, I want to leave you with a few reading tips. Certainly, many of you will have seen uh, reading recommendations going around uh, to help everyone understand uh, the continuing problems of racial injustice. 
And I think I have a few additional uh, book tips for you that are more focused on this topic as well. And then I'll be very glad to engage in a uh, question and answer session with you. So first of all, so we're all on the same page. Um, let's define what I mean by wealth. Uh, wealth is different from income. Income is an economic flow. All of you know it. It comes in monthly, often as earnings, as transfers. Uh, but wealth is an economic stock. It's everything we own. And in many cases, that includes real assets, maybe a home, real estate, a vehicle. It may include financial assets, such as savings, stocks, other financial instruments, minus all debts and obligations we hold, say credit card debt, a mortgage, student loans. When we add all of that together, uh, we normally call that net worth. So the sum of all real assets and financial assets minus debts, that is what we call net worth. And in the remainder of the talk, I will largely uh, talk about net worth when I say wealth. It's also worth noting that wealth is really partly independent of income. It is not the same thing, and it also isn't perfectly correlated. It is not the case that all income-rich households are also, wealth, uh, are also wealthy or that all income-poor households have no wealth. Uh, certainly the two um, are associated, but not perfectly. And beyond that, uh, wealth matters on its own for the economic well-being of families and especially for the opportunities of the next generation, as you will see in this talk. So that is what I mean by wealth uh, net worth. And let me start us off uh, with a quick exercise. So I hope whether whatever device you're on, I think you can participate in that. I'll let you take a quiz. It's anonymous, uh, um, but I will share the results, the aggregate results in a second. And the question I want to pose to you is the following. Um, just how big is the black-white wealth gap in this country? So imagine if the average white family today had a net worth of $100, the average black family would have a net worth of $81, $58, or $25, or $10. And I'll start that uh, poll and give you a moment to think about this. And to clarify, when I say the average family, uh, for those of you who know, um, that means uh, median net worth. So if the average white family had $100, how much would the average black family have? And I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll and I'll show you uh, what you've all voted for. Um, so none of you believe that uh, the average black family holds $81. Um, some of you uh, think it's 58, um, about one third of you believes it's $25 and more than 40% think it's $10. And in many ways, I'm not happy to let you know uh, that you are correct, that uh, the right answer is 10. The average black family holds $10 on $100. Uh, just to give you a sense of how that compares, $81, for example, 81%, that is uh, the gender wage gap. So the average earnings of females uh, compared to males, uh, $58 is the racial income gap, and $10 is the racial net worth gap. Uh, we got someone else on mic, so perhaps you can mute yourself, thanks. So it's a really staggering gap in net worth, as I would say, uh, as I would hope all of you agree. One of the question is how much of that gap is also replicated across generations. Now, as I'll say again uh, during this talk, there are a number of normative stances you can have towards inequality. Uh, some of you may be more bothered by it than others. But uh, there seems to be more agreement that uh, when that inequality translates into inequality and opportunities, that that is especially bothersome. So one perspective uh, that speaks to that 
is to ask how similar the wealth of parents is to that of their adult children, or what sociologists and economists call social mobility. Uh, just how much uh, do the two generations correspond to each other? And for that, I do want to show you a uh, new research based on the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, the PSID. Uh, some of you may know that the Panel Study of Income Dynamics has been collected at the University of Michigan for more than half a century. It's the leading social science survey in the United States to uh, address these kinds of questions and is a nationally representative household panel study. So I'll show you some uh, new results from the PSID that allows us to address this question uh, because it assessed wealth of households in the 80s uh, and then continued to um, follow their children as they grew up and formed their own households and then measured recently their adult wealth also, allowing us to ask just how similar are the two generations. Um, and to do that, I will share another um, kind of screen. Um, which shows um, the intergenerational movement uh, starting on the left here. You will see, um, I hope you will see, um, children who grew up in the middle of the wealth distribution. So in the middle 20%. Um, you, you may call that the wealth middle class. And then you see on the right where, where they move to as adults. Do they stay at the middle? Do they fall down to the bottom 20%, for example, or do they move up to the top 20%? And uh, the colors here signify race. So the blue dots are black children and the orange dots are white children. And as by now you will see, there are much more pronounced downward mobility trends among black children who grew up in the middle than among white children. So there are continuing processes today that allocate even black children who grew up towards the middle of the distribution back to the bottom. Um, we will give you the link to this visualization if you want to play around with it. Um, and you could you know, look at different kinds of starting positions. You could look at children who grow up at the very top and you would see the same pattern. Although I actually, at the specific one, I would uh, caution you to look at because in many ways, it's not a great way to look at what is happening to the uh, wealth distribution. Because as you can already guess from the numbers I've shown you, there are barely any black children who grow up at the top of the wealth distribution. And for that, let me show you a different kind of visualization that scales um, the um, children across all these starting positions to be representative uh, for the wealth distribution. So now you will see that a much larger share of black children here signified as uh, blue dots grow up at the bottom of the wealth distribution or in the bottom two, percent, uh, bottom two quintiles. Um, and you see movement. Not everyone stays in the same, in the same position. Um, and then you see where they end up. And I would say that uh, this kind of view provides you with a pretty classical sociological view, view of what is happening. There is movement throughout, uh, but the racial wealth structure is reproduced pretty stably, right? So although you see a lot of movement here, um, if you put your hands into the middle of this visualization, if you didn't know, you would think uh, not a whole lot has changed. And indeed, at the structural level, not a whole lot has changed. So let me go back. Uh, if you're interested in playing around with this on your own, uh, here's the link, viz.theinequalitylab.com. So that last visualization, I hope, uh, was one example to tell you that racial wealth gaps arise, of course, from two uh, processes, one being the long-term effects of prior exploitation and discrimination and a long history of racial exclusion, starting, of course, with slavery and going through the centuries. But at the same time, there are continuing processes of institutional racism that replicate the racialized wealth structure. It's important to keep both of these perspectives in mind. 
So what contributes to that ongoing persistence of racial wealth gaps? I would say that the mechanisms today through which wealth and racial wealth gaps are reproduced may of course be less transparent than in prior times, but no less effective. So of course, slavery is a very transparent way of prohibiting African-American families from accumulating assets, from owning anything, from um, enjoying the fruits of their labor. Um, the mechanisms today are less transparent, but certainly effective. Uh, in some of our work, this collaborative, as the visualization was with Sasha Killeweld uh, from Harvard University, um, we've assessed channels through which wealth is reproduced. And there are a lot of early life processes that profit from growing up wealthy, as is probably not a surprise to most of you. Um, and uh, that includes getting access to good education, getting access to home ownership, business ownership, to marriage, and, and finally at a much later time to inheritances. But what's interesting is that that access, for example, to education, then allows children to accumulate assets on their own. So this intergenerational wealth uh, correlation is, goes through the channel of education and home ownership. Um, those are very important um, channels to make up for this persistence of wealth. And also for the uh, racial differences as access to them, but also their payoff differs across races in the sense that uh, black families not only uh, have more limited access to these channels, but also they profit less from them. And this is uh, where processes of institutional racism uh, come in. And uh, while the list could be long, I just want to give you a few examples of what I consider forms of institutional racism. Some of them may not be surprising to you, and others may be. Perhaps the less surprising is that uh, home appreciation rates are lower for Black households. I think many of you know that uh, minority neighborhoods typically have different trajectories of uh, home value growth. In that sense, not only are uh, black households disadvantaged in access to housing, uh, they're lower, much lower home ownership rates, but also once they do own the homes, uh, they have less economic benefit from doing so. That certainly is uh, a form of institutional racism undergirded by processes that we can talk about uh, later too. But one of them is actually predatory inclusion as a term that's relatively new um, and you can always see the references at the bottom here. And uh, it describes a situation where lenders or financial institutions offer needed services to black households, but on exploitative terms that limit or eliminate their long-term benefits. Examples for that are subprime mortgages. And that's certainly something we've seen during the recent Great Recession, where uh, minority households have been targeted with substandard financial products that eventually actually contributed to even greater wealth losses among minority households than white households. Subprime mortgages are probably the most obvious example of predatory inclusion, but other examples are being studied too. And one of them is student loans, how they're structured, who they're given to, and for what kind of educational careers. And, um, there has been a great increase following the Great Recession also in student loans being held by African-American uh, students, uh, but often uh, to attend colleges whose economic benefits are at best uh, doubtful. And I encourage you to um, consult some of the work uh, that you see at the bottom. So these are, of course, uh, only some examples of what I consider to undergird these continuing processes. Um, so the challenge, in my view, is quite big, but I do want to leave you with a final poll. So we'll do another one of these that's very similarly structured. Um, because if we look forward, and I hope we get there today during the Q&A, to ask, you know, how can we, how can we deal with this? Um, we probably also want to focus on the current generation, where we have an opportunity to do things differently. And to focus on the current generation, I want to ask you a similar question yet again, and I'll open the poll in a second. Um, so you remember the uh, racial wealth gap. 
this is a slightly different um, way to look at it. And that is, if the average white child today was to grow up in a household with a net worth of $100, the average black child would grow up in a household with 15, 10, five or $1. So the only difference here is that we're not talking about families or households, we're talking about children. Um, so it, it changes the population slightly. Um, and I will open that poll. And since you already know the general structure, I'll just give you a few seconds uh, to take a guess. So the average white child has $100. What does the average black child has today? Okay, I'll give you two more seconds. Okay. Uh, so close to half of you believe that the answer is $5. Some of you believe it's one, some of you believe it's 10. Um, if it was 10, um, children, it, so 10 was the, the average gap uh, for all households. Uh, the situation for children, unfortunately, is worse, and it's much worse. It is one dollar on a hundred dollars. Um, as a recent publication called A Penny on the Dollar has computed, um, the today's racial wealth gaps among children are even more staggering than what we're used to when we look at just families. So this is what we're up to. And this is a number that I think is worthwhile remembering to know what the current distribution of economic well-being looks like for the next generation that we may worry about. Okay, so this is the first part and admittedly depressing part of the presentation. Um, I can tell you it gets less depressing, but I do want to um, bring us to uh, look at wealth inequality in broader patterns. I think there is a lot to be said um, how the black and white wealth gaps um, relate to each other, um, how white wealth was built in this country on the, on the back of black families. But at the same time, I want to make sure that we understand that wealth inequality is something uh, that has been growing over time and that has been affecting a lot of different families. And to do so, uh, I want to show you a graph that I just updated uh, with new data and not seen before. You'll be the first ones to see the, uh, the very latest data. Uh, but here's a comparison of the wealth distribution over different periods of time. Uh, so let me take a second to explain what's going on here. Um, this is again based on PSID data. It's cross-sectional data. So in each year uh, here at the bottom, we look at the wealth distribution and we see how different distributional points have developed over time. So for example, this point here is the median, the average household or the net worth uh, below which 50% of the population are, uh, compared to where it was in 1984. So we started 100% and you see it goes up nicely by about, uh, I would say, you know, 20%. 20, 20%. So the average American family has experienced a growth in net worth between 84 and 99. But when you go up the distribution, so this is the 75th percentile, the point in the wealth distribution below which there are 75% of the population, you see that that growth has been faster, steeper. And the more you go up, 90th percentile, 95th percentile, you see even more pronounced increases, 50%, and that's uh, uh, period. And at the bottom, 25%, you see barely any movement. So that was the last couple of decades of the last century. You see some progress for the average American family, but you also see growing inequality. Here's the next phase up to 2007, pre-recession. Um, and you see that that pattern continues and accelerates. You see a, a larger spreading of the wealth distribution. But still, median uh, net worth goes up. The average American family is wealthier in 2007 than it was in 1984. Uh, but that applies all the more at the top. So for example, the 95th percentile 
is more than twice where it was in 1984. And you already see some decreases before the Great Recession at the bottom. And now the recession hits. So this is just between 2007 and 2009. You see widespread loss across the wealth distribution. Uh, of course, in absolute terms, millions of dollars destroyed here at the top. Uh, but in relative terms, much steeper decreases in the middle and at the bottom, the middle falling back to where it was uh, 30 years before that. And here comes the um, so-called post-recession period up to 2007. Uh, you see quite unequal recovery. You see much quicker recovery at the top. The 90th and 95th percentile is back to where it was before the Great Recession. Um, the median net worth is just getting back towards where it was um, in 1984. So uh, no progress over all this time and anemic growth here at the bottom. And here's the new uh, shiny uh, data. This is based on an early release data from the panel study of income dynamics and has not been uh, shown in public before. Um, but here's an early look at 2019, and I'm labeling this uh, pre-COVID-19. Um, and what you see is that inequality continues to grow. If these data are correct, and early release data may still change over time, um, we do not see further improvements here uh, across the most of the distribution. In fact, if anything, we see worsening at the bottom, and we see um, the continued growth at the very top. Uh, this is pre-COVID-19, and I think it's uh, not difficult to guess what is going to happen to the wealth distribution during the ongoing time. Um, now, if this appears like a really large increase in inequality, you're right, but I will also uh, tell you that we're, of course, looking here at across the distribution, but we're not even looking at the very wealthy. The 95th percentile is still far away from the kind of billionaires that some of you may have in mind. If you're interested in those, uh, here's another graph. This actually spans 100 years, starts in 1913, and in this case ends in 2013. Um, and this is the wealth held by the top, not 1%, but top 0.1%. And you see that um, we are today back uh, to where we were last time in 1929, right before the Great Depression. Uh, so after the Great Depression, there was this compression, it remained stable, and then since the uh, late 70s, we have continuing increases in wealth concentration at the very, very top. But this is actually something that I haven't really talked about in this, uh, in this presentation, uh, the concentration at the very top, um, which has also been increasing. Uh, what I wanna make sure that you understand that uh, even among, let's say the remaining 99%, wealth inequality has been stark and growing and especially along racial lines. So I have one more piece of information uh, for you and then um, some, some other um, thoughts. I already said that uh, there may be different opinions on just how bad inequality itself is, but people get um, concerned, especially more people get concerned uh, once we're talking about inequalities and opportunities. And one way to look at this is to ask how children from different wealth backgrounds fare um, in terms of their opportunities. And here we're looking at educational opportunities. Um, so what you see here uh, are the graduation rates. This is the uh, solid line from college of children born in the 70s and children born in the 80s who grew up at the bottom of the wealth distribution in the bottom 20%. And you see that these are really low college graduation rates. Only one in 10 children who grow up in the bottom 20% attain a college degree. You see here uh, that a few more have been attending college, but uh, the graduation rate really hasn't changed. Uh, let's look at the middle of the wealth distribution. This is the middle, uh, 40%. 25% graduation, 26% graduation rates of children born in the 70s, and that actually went up a little bit uh, to 33% 
for children born in the 80s, some progress. But here is what it looks like at the top of the wealth distribution. This is children born in the 70s and 90s and born to the top 20% of the wealth distribution. And you see a tremendous increase in uh, college graduation rates from 46% to 60% in the span of just 10 years. So what that means is that children who grow up in the top 20% of the wealth distribution have pulled away from everyone else in terms of their college attainment. So what I showed you before is a growth in wealth inequality. And now you also see uh, that the children who've experienced some of that growth uh, have also become more unequal in their educational attainment. And to directly relate, and this is what I'll end on uh, for this part, these two stories, uh, let me mark up where the children that we just looked at when they grew up, this is the period and the growth of inequality during which these uh, students uh, grew up, right? Their high school years. They were born in the 70s and 80s. And what you see in yellow here is the growth and in inequality that they experienced. And I go back and these are the outcomes. So I'm only showing you this to say, again, we're up against really, really uh, difficult trends here as wealth inequality has been increasing much further since. Okay, so to wrap up, what I've shown you today is uh, some data on the extent and reproduction of racial wealth gaps. Numbers that I hope you will remember is that uh, the net worth gap uh, between black families and white families is 10% and between children is 1%. And that these gaps arise from both the legacy and the persistence of institutional racism. But also that wealth inequality should concern us, not just from a, a racial perspective, but one of the general distribution of economic well-being in this country, as wealth inequality has been rising sharply for several decades. And some of that wealth inequality is now starting to translate into inequality and opportunities, such as college attainment. Responses. Um, I think this is, of course, where political uh, commitments come in, where uh, normative judgments come in. But if you do want to ask me, I think it's, in fact, quite um, easy to put out uh, potential responses. And I think now is a time where the country is ready to hear more radical approaches to it. Uh, some of them may be uh, focused on a remedy of past injustice, um, such as reparations for African-American households, uh, the cancellation of student debt as it, as it partly arises from predatory uh, lending. Uh, other uh, policy proposals that are out there that are really much more focused on the current generation and on going forward and equalizing the wealth distribution. Uh, there is the idea of baby bonds, or some call, sometimes called stakeholder grants, um, that is in some ways parallel to the idea of unconditional income, but for wealth. That is, that there is an unconditional grant that each child uh, receives, and that is paid out as they um, uh, turn, turn into adults. Uh, but also other policies that have long been discussed uh, to ensure that for example, housing processes uh, don't amount to racial inequality. And, and all of those uh, rely on desegregating neighborhoods and schools that have resegregated over the last couple of decades. Um, but third, and this is a perspective that I find particularly attractive, if we are concerned that you know, this radical, radically unequal distribution of wealth translates into inequality and economic well-being and opportunity, perhaps there are also way, ways for us to limit the importance of private wealth uh, for well-being and opportunity. Um, and I would call that uh, you know, ways of expanding public wealth. And there are many ways in which you do that, but the college example probably is the most obvious one. Um, if private wealth has become more important for college attainment, then a form of public wealth is to have free colleges uh, that unlink some of that um, private wealth from educational success. And if the question is brought up, how to ever pay for these things, um, then certainly 
uh, inheritance and wealth taxation, um, whether it's reasonable or not, um, whether it's you know politically feasible, uh, would provide uh, ample um, uh, public money uh, to do that, ample revenue. Okay. So um, if this topic has gotten you um, to think about uh, wealth, about racial gaps, and you want to add to your reading list, um, here are three excellent books that I would recommend. Black, White Wealth, Gap, uh, Black Wealth, White Wealth is sort of the foundational statement, one of the first books that has shown uh, these racial wealth gaps and have explained and traced them. Uh, the Hidden Cost of African, Being African American is an excellent book in ethnography that shows you really what wealth does to families and what the lack of wealth does. And uh, very recently written uh, by Sandy Darity and Kristen Mullen. Uh, Kristen Mullen is a book on reparations and what it would take to get there. So these are three books very much focused on racial wealth inequality. Um, and other books, you know, other sort of dimensions of racial inequality that you may be interested in and that are not really covered in most of the uh, reading lists that I've seen out there. The New Jim Crow, I think you, many of you have seen. Um, to me, there's only one other dimension of, of uh, racial inequality that is as staggering in numbers as it is for wealth, and that's an incarceration. Uh, there's a wonderful book on the black middle class by Mary Patillo and uh, a, a, a really impactful book, uh, Racism Without Races, on what colorblind racism does to racial inequality. So I know I have to wrap up pretty soon. I will leave you with uh, some speaker information uh, on myself, on the Center for Inequality Dynamics, and on the Institute for Social Research. Um, and, but I do want to take two minutes just to tell you about this new effort that we are beginning uh, in the Center for Inequality Dynamics. It's a new research center dedicated to these kinds of topics, the study of socioeconomic inequality as it changes or persists. Uh, it involves faculty and students from across campus, from many departments, and is currently housed at the U of M Survey Research Center. We were supposed to have our inaugural lecture uh, with Dr. Thomas Piketty um, before, um, all of this happened and we're currently rescheduling. So if you want to follow us, we'd love to invite you, you know, if this ever comes to, you know, if ever we have public talks again uh, to that delayed inaugural. Um, I also encourage you to check out our website and you will find that we address a lot of topics um, related to today's talk. Um, and among the 50 affiliates, both faculty, postdocs, and graduate students, uh, they cover a lot of these topics. And um, if you're interested in, in this kind of uh, topic, I will also tell you that a team and I are beginning a much broader effort to study wealth for this country. We're beginning a collaboration with the Internal Revenue Service where we have access to tax data and are trying to back out wealth measures for the entire US population and link them across generations so we can actually trace these same topics that I showed you today across the US. Uh, we can see where wealth is uh, in the US, uh, how wealth mobility differs across different regions, and then also how local policy changes impact wealth and mobility. And with that, um, I say thank you. I'll wrap up and I would be happy to um, field some questions. Okay, um, so I'll go right into the Q&A. Uh, we have one open question that I'll uh, read out. Several Fed research papers show the importance of social security wealth and a broader measure of wealth. How would your results change if you included social security wealth? While your basic point would likely remain, it would be nice to know the effects of the dramatic increase in social security since 1968, thanks. That's an excellent point. In fact, it is true that one large source of privately held wealth is our different forms of pension wealth. Public pensions, uh, such as Social Security, are one form. There are also employer-based pensions. And there is an increased interest in adding those to privately held wealth. Now, I think that's debatable and really depends on what kind of questions you want to address. 
um, because social security wealth certainly is not accessible to you, right? So if it's about financing your child's college education and you're far from retirement age, your social security wealth does not matter at that very moment. But for other kinds of uh, topics, social security wealth may matter and may be included here. So what happens when you do that? Uh, wealth inequality tends to go down as these public forms of wealth are less heavily concentrated. But what's really interesting is that um, if we look at the US, for example, in international comparison, um, the US is a true outlier, as I'm arguing in my, one of my current papers, in terms of the wealth concentration at the top and broader levels of wealth inequality. Um, there are some countries that get close, surprisingly Sweden and Norway, but what would happen there is uh, Sweden and Norway have very substantial security, social security systems, public wealth systems. If you add those on, um, wealth concentration goes down, but even more so in those countries. Um, so it's a good point. Um, the other topic, not to belabor this, because I want to get to others, um, is that other forms of pensions, for example, employer-based uh, pensions, are also important. Um, and there has been a major change in them uh, from defined benefit schemes to defined contribution schemes. And in that change, I think a lot of additional inequality has been created too. But there is an ongoing effort uh, to, to create these augmented net worth measures. Uh, next question, how easy is it to get access to IRS data? Uh, the answer is not at all. Uh, every year about 10 researchers, every other year about 10 researchers are selected uh, to get that kind of access, which is not the model that ISR uh, pursues. We're in the business of creating publicly accessible data, but the plan for this project is uh, to create geographic aggregates of these uh, measures that will then be distributed. Uh, it follows a model that has been laid out by Rush Chetty at Harvard uh, for very similar things for income. Next question, uh, do you see anything currently happening now to mitigate this gap? Uh, no, um, what I've seen recently is a tax reform that is increasing this gap. But I do see uh, a historical moment that may allow us to discuss alternative approaches. Uh, next question, is there a discussion among faculty who study racism, in particular institutional racism, about how we can apply this knowledge to our own practices and behavior at our own institute? Um, I think there is, and I think a lot of institutions uh, on campus are having these uh, discussions. Um, I think they are mostly pushed by the DI, a diversity, equity, and inclusion group. Uh, but certainly we're hoping that my research and the research that other faculty members do here can inform these efforts because they should inform, right? So institutional racism doesn't just happen outside the doors of the Institute. They pertain to society. Uh, what would happen if you differentiated between colleges versus community colleges in your data? This is a great question. And um, I only study bachelor's attainment, so most community colleges don't grant bachelor's degree, a bachelor's degree. Um, but um, the, the general question, um, I think, points towards this idea of um, differentiating between institu int institutional types in higher education. So we have a follow-up project um, that looks at what types of institutions these students assess. Uh, um, um, attend. And um, my, my hunch is that this takeoff at the very top that you see is really driven by children from wealthier backgrounds increasingly accessing well-resourced um, four-year institutions. Because in the end, what, what I showed you is basically about persistence. Uh, it's about who persists to college degree. And we know that that is driven mostly by where you attend. So it may be the case, and we're waiting the empirical answer, that it's really about where you attend. Next question. Uh, you have suggestions about how to address, uh, you gave suggestions about how to address some of these issues. However, some folks may consider things like reparations and restructuring taxes to be radically liberal. Consequently, they're unlikely to occur. What can an individual person do in order to work towards progress on the issue of wealth inequality? That's a wonderful question. I, I enjoy that. And, and I think as an individual, uh, you're, 
you are doing uh, uh, the work right now in getting informed um, and in knowing exactly what we're up against. Um, whether they are radically liberal or not, um, I think is a different question. My hunch is that this country is entering a phase where more people become aware of these issues and um, may become more amendable to thinking about alternatives. Um, you know, income taxation was considered radical before it was introduced. Many institutional, many, many scholars thought it was absolutely uh, unthinkable, unconstitutional. Um, but things change, and we may be at such historical moment. Next question. If the payoffs to things like a college education are lower for Blacks, how should we consider the equalizing ability of policies like free college? Yes, that is a very tricky and, and very insightful uh, question. So often, and certainly I focus on this uh, in this presentation too, um, a quick answer to some of our solutions, uh, to some of our, some of our issues are, if only everyone um, you know, would get a college education, we could get everyone into education, and we know that education has been a great motor of mobility in this country. Um, but it is indeed the case that the payoff to education for black individuals is lower than that to whites. So none of these policies, I think, can exist on their own. And I think if anything, partly through the visualization that I showed you, I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that there are these continuing processes that push uh, black families down in the wealth distribution um, and that intervention requires really intervention in many different in many different areas. This may not be an entirely satisfying um, satisfying reply to you because it basically says a lot of things have to change, uh, but I think that is how the world operates at the moment. Uh, next question. Uh, it seems as if the wealth disparities persist regardless of which major political party is in power. Is it true? And if so, would it take a much more progressive political platform in order to change the dynamic? So I think it is uh, true that uh, you've seen these wealth increases uh, over the last decades, and we know that administrations have changed uh, during that time. And, and yet, uh, the processes that have continue to increase wealth inequality have persisted too. Um, I do think that it takes a more aggressive uh, plan to tackle some of these issues. Um, I've provided a few possible responses, uh, but the, the idea of public wealth, I think, uh, is one that, um, that I hope uh, gets some traction. And I will remind you that it is true, it, it's, it's probably easy to say that, so if nothing changed over the last 40 years, why would it change now? I will remind you that um, things do change and that what used to be considered radical ideas are all of a sudden part of the conversations. Reparations, Sandy Darity did this work in the 1990s. No one listened, he was a lone voice. And today, at least on one side of the political aisle, every presidential candidate had a platform that included some type of reparations. Unconditional basic income, similar story. It was a political no-go, uh, and now is at least part of the conversation. I think this country is about to have new ideas uh, be part of that conversation. Next question. Uh, Marlies Scherr, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't want to, um, considering that most politicians are at the top, how realistic is it to think that policies will pass that would tax wealth? What can we do to make that happen? The million dollar question, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm not an organizer. Uh, I'm just here to relay the facts and, and let people make up their minds. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm, you know, should trust my advice over anyone else's, um, but I will just comment on the observation that uh, the wealth of our representatives is much higher than the wealth of the general population. And I think um, when everything is done um, and people will trace the impact of the most recent tax reforms and the distribution of its benefits, 
I think more people uh, will be bothered uh, by the fact of who's being served. Um, and uh, this is not new, but it's certainly um, sort of a, a continuing uh, preferential uh, taxation of very wealthy households. Perhaps the even more um, surprising one is uh, inheritance taxation as part of the uh, Bush tax cuts that, um, you know, inheritance taxation used to be a widely held value even, I think, across the aisle, uh, but has been radically um, scaled down. So I can't tell you what we need to do to make it happen, but you're describing that reality. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, can you talk a bit more about the IRS project and how that project will impact policy? So I'm happy to do that. Uh, the uh, IRS project is really, in many ways, a data project, as we typically have them at ISR, where we're trying to put together new data to allow people to analyze them in ways that we haven't even envisioned. This is the story of PSID, you know, when people in 1968 uh, here at ISR put together the, uh, the study, um, little did they know that I would come around 50 years later um, and run a study of intergenerational wealth mobility. Um, I have a similar vision for the IRS project, especially in the distribution of these uh, geographic aggregates. I'm hoping that um, people will know of uh, local policy changes, state policy changes, and uh, other experiments um, that they can relate uh, to those measures. So um, I am hopeful that it will impact, impact policy, but it will, re it will require you know, the broad scientific community um, uh, to do that work. Uh, in, in that sense, we're, we're building the infrastructure uh, to be able to do that. Uh, next question. Oh yeah, we're going towards the, the future. Uh, we just, one just disappeared. What are the goals for the new Center for Inequality Dynamics? Um, we're very excited about building a new type of institution um, that brings people together around the topic of inequality and is both multidisciplinary and egalitarian. So we have really good involvement of graduate students. Uh, we're building a new space because um, we want to rethink how we train our graduate students. Um, if you'd like to go to the web page, you will see uh, that we'll, we're calling it the CID Studio. We're working with faculty from the Taubman Architectural College uh, to design a new space to support sort of the new generation of inequality scholars. In that sense, the Center for Inequality Dynamics understands itself as a basic science, a foundational science institute. Um, the data that we create hopefully will be very policy relevant, but we really want to push forward the foundational science on inequality. And what I showed you today, I consider foundational science. It's what we need to understand what we're up against. Uh, one more question. What role should better financial education in the schools play? Wouldn't that help future generations that grow up without getting such training from their parents. Uh, so financial education is often discussed in the policy community. Um, personally, I do not think that that is a major way in which we can get out of this problem. Um, there may be ways to help families avoid predatory lending. Uh, that will be important. But uh, in the end, the, I would count that as among smaller scale intervention that will not move the needle enough. Another one of them that is getting a lot of uh, engagement and a lot of um, excitement in the policy community is asset building. Um, asset building is the idea that we can induce poor households to save some money. Um, and there's actually some evidence that suggests that that, that that is possible. And it's quite a feat. Uh, for example, to get an income poor household to save $500. And that can make a difference, right? If you blow your tire on, on your way to work, um, the, you know, $500 will fix it. And if you don't have them, uh, you may miss the next day at work. Uh, you may get fired. After that, you lose your home and so on. So it may be that even those smaller sums can prevent some of those trickle-down effects of these impacts. At the same time, um, I think um, wealth 
that is really impactful to families is much beyond that level of $500. In ongoing war, uh, work with Richard Rodems, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the um, at Poverty Solutions and at the Center for Inequality Dynamics, we're showing that uh, to prevent material hardship, we need much larger sums of wealth to insure people against these kinds of impacts. Um, I don't think those are attainable just by uh, telling people how to be smarter about investing. Okay, we are three minutes to 12. I think I've talked enough and I've held most of you. Um, uh, Let me jump I, in, uh, Fabian, and, uh, and just thank you for the uh, fantastic presentation full of uh, lots of great data and visualizations. Uh, ex excellent job. Uh, as you say, it's interesting to think back to the uh, creation of the panel study of income dynamics, which Jim, Jim Morgan designed and implemented in 1968 and made ISR uh, one of the leading Centers for Studying Poverty and Inequality, uh, continuing lots of work that had started even before that, and great to see this new, whole new generation of, uh, of research on uh, inequality. So, fantastic presentation. Thanks to everybody. We, uh, once again, uh, had about 150 people uh, in, in, in attendance. Uh, these have really been a great series. Check out the previous episodes online. This one will also be, um, made available in uh, in video uh, shortly, so you can check that out on the website. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming and thanks Fabian for a fantastic presentation. Bye everybody.